Okay, welcome, and thank you for coming to this presentation. I'm Susan Barton. I'm the founder of Bright Solutions for Dyslexia, and I hope you're here to learn a lot about a condition called dyslexia, both what the classic warning signs are, the symptoms, and most importantly, the solutions. And people have asked me, Susan, why do you spend your life traveling from one end of the country to the other educating people about dyslexia? Well, the reason is it's a very common condition and it's greatly misunderstood. And there's a lot of myths out there about dyslexia that I'd like to clear up right now at the beginning. The three most common myths about dyslexia, myths they are not true. Number one, when I tell people I'm in the field of dyslexia, the thing I almost always hear is, oh, dyslexia. Isn't that where you see things backwards? That is the most commonly held misbelief out there. It is not true. Yes, they will confuse their B's and their D's. Yes, they will sometimes read was for saw, but it's not because they're seeing it backwards. They see things the same way everybody else does. It's due to auditory confusions. And most people don't realize there's a big component of dyslexia that impacts auditory processing. The number two most common myth I hear is, well, my child can't be dyslexic, my child can read. Everybody with dyslexia can read, up to a point. But then they surprise everybody when this bright child runs into this brick wall of reading development by third grade, if not sooner. And then no matter how smart they are and how hard they try, unless they're taught differently, they won't be able to get over that brick wall of third grade reading. And I'll explain why that happens in today's presentation. But since they can read for a while, reading is actually the worst way to pick up kids early. And the earlier we pick it up, the better. A better way to pick it up early is to look at their spelling. Their spelling will be miserable from day one. Now with a lot of work, and I do mean a lot of work, Maybe they can memorize 20 spelling words on Monday and do okay on Friday's test. But these are the kids where the spelling doesn't stick. By the very next day, the words they got fine on the spelling test, they can't spell half of them. And by the following Monday, they can't spell any of them anymore. And they can spell them on the test, but they can't spell them when they have to write sentences or write paragraphs. But dyslexia affects a whole lot more than reading and spelling. You can pick it up early by listening to kids who say things like Biscetti, Aminal, Hangeberg, Hospital, Magazine. That is right, Mazagine. <laughs> okay. Calipiter. Okay. The kids who have a hard time learning to tie their shoes, who have a hard time memorizing the names of the letters and the sequence of the alphabet and their multiplication tables. And on and on and on it goes. It doesn't affect just reading, writing, spelling. It affects many, many, many areas of their lives. And I'll go into those classic warning signs today in great detail, because that's how you can pick them up early. Don't look at the reading, because they can fake it for a while in the reading. Look at all the other things that come along with dyslexia. And then the third most common myth is, well, OK, so it exists, but it's pretty rare, isn't it? No, not according to the researchers at the National Institutes of Health, who have been conducting scientific systematic studies on dyslexia for more than 28 years. According to those researchers, dyslexia impacts 20% of people in our country. That's huge. That's one out of five. Now, it does come in degrees, from mild, to moderate, to severe, to profound. And if that weren't enough variation, some people have just dyslexia, but some people have both dyslexia and attention deficit disorder, which also comes in degrees from mild to moderate to severe to profound, and it comes with or without hyperactivity. Why do I mention that? I am an authority in both fields. But today, I'm going to be focusing on just dyslexia. 
I bring that up for parents and teachers who have kids they know have ADD. If you know a child has ADD and what I share with you tonight sounds awfully familiar, guess what? They've got more than just ADD. The warning signs of dyslexia that I'm going to share with you tonight are unique to dyslexia. But what you have to know, it's not uncommon for a child to have both. You can have just dyslexia. You can have just ADD. But about half the kids who have one have the other. It is not uncommon for a child to have both. But what I share with you tonight, I hope will make you start thinking of kids you know or suspect have this issue. And then it'll get really confusing if tomorrow you go back to your school and say, would you mind testing this child for dyslexia? Some of you have tried that already. And some schools still today will tell you things like, well, there is no such thing as dyslexia. We don't believe in dyslexia. You can't test for it. Or you can't test for it till at least third grade. Or we couldn't possibly test for it. It's a medical issue. A doctor has to test for it. And none of that is true. But I am going to share with you what we do know tonight about dyslexia. Here's what I'm going to go over. I'm going to go over the classic warning signs of dyslexia. Because the warning signs of dyslexia don't start just when they hit school. The classic warning signs of dyslexia show up as early as age one. And if a child truly has dyslexia, they'll have lots and lots of these before they start school. And these are things a parent would have known about. They would have seen. You can ask them about it. But they had no idea this was tied to dyslexia. They just seem like little quirky things. So we'll go over the classic warning signs that you as a parent, you as a teacher, would know about this child. Why? Because since schools do not test children for dyslexia, most people who have it go unidentified. But if you know what the classic warning signs are, you can start informally picking them out yourself. And I need to let you know that absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing, can mimic dyslexia except dyslexia. The more warning signs that match, the more confident you can be. That's why this child is struggling. Don't wait for a formal diagnosis, because there aren't enough certified dyslexia testing specialists to go around. The more warning signs that match, the more confident you can be. Go directly to the solutions. Because we do have solutions. We do know how to bring their reading, writing, spelling skills up to and beyond grade level. So after I go over the warning signs, I will go over research-based best practices. How do we help? And I will also go over what does not work. Because there are some very good programs out there that will work for some kids, but will backfire if the reason the child is struggling is due to dyslexia. So hopefully, that's what you'd like to learn today, because that's what I'll be sharing with you during this presentation. Now, what if you have questions? If you're here in the audience, I would prefer not to be interrupted with questions, but I can stay afterwards and answer questions for as long as you would like. However, some of you are not here live. You're actually seeing this on a video or DVD. You can ask me questions, too. Because Bright Solutions for Dyslexia is an information and resource center. Our job is to answer questions, and we do that freely all day long. So if you have a question, you're welcome to call us at our office. You can ask for me. If I'm there, I'll be happy to talk to you. And our office number is 408-559-3652. But I do travel quite a bit, so sometimes I'm not there. If you want to be sure of getting me, you can also send me an email, because I travel with a computer and I answer email from wherever I am. So if you'd like to send your questions to me by email, my email address is susan at brightsolutions.us, which stands for United States. And please do go take a moment and check your cell phones and make sure they are turned off. 
Okay, let's get started. What is dyslexia anyway? I'm going to give you the five most important points that I wish everybody in the world knew about dyslexia. I'm going to give you the big picture first, and then I'll come in and fill in the details. The most important thing I wish people understood is where dyslexia comes from. Because when a child starts to struggle in school, we tend to point fingers at each other and blame each other. And we need to stop doing that. Sometimes a teacher will say, it's your fault he's struggling with reading. If you'd read to him every night, he'd have it by now. No, that's not true. You could read every night to a child with dyslexia, and you should. But it won't teach him how to read rapidly and accurately by looking at the letters. And then parents point the fingers at teachers and said, it's your fault. I hear you guys are using whole language. If you just use phonics, that would solve the whole thing. No, it won't. Kids with dyslexia aren't ready for phonics. They won't succeed even with the best phonics program in the world. So we need to stop pointing fingers at each other and know where dyslexia comes from. It is a condition the child was born with, and it is an inherited condition. It runs strongly in family trees. It is one of the most inheritable conditions out there. And where the field is going, by the way, the researchers have isolated three genes responsible for dyslexia. And where we hope to be in about 10 years is in the following. When every child is born, we're just going to scrape the inside of their cheek, check their chromosomes and genes, and we'll know right then and there. This child, you can teach reading any way you want to. This child better get something special. And we won't wait until the beginning of third grade, till they're years and years behind, before we said, gee, maybe he has dyslexia. We'll know it from day one. But we're not there yet. The most important thing to know is the biggest risk factor for dyslexia is known dyslexia in the family tree. Every child born into a family tree where you know there's dyslexia in the family tree has 50-50 odds of having it themselves. It's a toss of a coin for every child born into that family tree. It is one of the most inheritable conditions out there. Why do I mention that? I mention that for teachers. Because I've talked to thousands of parents who knew there was dyslexia in their family tree. They saw their little guy struggle when he got to school, just like a child with dyslexia would struggle. And they went to their child's teacher and said, what do you think? Do you think it might be dyslexia? It runs in my family tree, you know. And the well-meaning teacher who knows nothing about dyslexia said, oh, couldn't possibly be. It's just developmental. Oh, please, teachers, don't ignore that when a parent shares with, that there's dyslexia in their family tree and their child is starting to struggle. The myth of developmental, it is truly a myth. The research shows very clearly that a child who is struggling with reading and spelling in mid-first grade has better than 90% odds of still struggling in those areas in eighth grade and on into adulthood if somebody doesn't step in and do something. Please don't ignore that when a parent shares that with you. The odds are pretty good, oh yes. But I've heard the opposite from teachers. I've heard from caring teachers who came to a session like this and told me, Susan, the entire time you were talking, Johnny's face kept flashing in front of my eyes. This is Johnny, this is Johnny, this is Johnny. So when I was done, I asked for a meeting with Johnny's parents. And I said, by any chance, is there dyslexia in your family tree? And they told me with all honesty, no. Because most people who have it don't know they have it, especially if they have it mildly to moderately. Why don't they know? Because schools still today, most of them, don't test for it. But I'm going to share with you what dyslexia would look like in an adult who had it only mildly. Because if an adult has it mildly, they will recognize the following. They'll know this about themselves. They will know they did OK in school, but they were a solid C student. Yeah, they got some Bs, a few Ds, but it's pretty much a C average. But they worked their tail off for those Cs. 
They worked five times harder than their friends, and their grades did not reflect the amount of effort they put in. They probably went to college and graduated. <laughs> Might have been on the five or six year plan instead of the four year plan, but that's okay. But I can guarantee you, before they signed up for any class, they checked with a professor or somebody who'd taken the course before to find out, do you require written papers in this class? And if so, you avoided that class if at all possible. Because written expression is still your weakest skill. But you graduated, you have a job, you have a family, you have a career, and you can read. But you will know the following about your reading. You are very slow at it. You're about three times slower than anybody else, and you know it and you're a little embarrassed about it. You'll also know that if you have to read anything technical outside of what you normally read, you probably have to read it two or three or four times to comprehend it. How come? Because the first time you read it, you read the words you know for sure, skip the ones you don't, and hope it makes sense. And it probably won't make total sense, but at least now you have some idea what the article was about, so now you can try it a second time and better guess at the words you skipped the first time. And you might do that three times, maybe the most four, before you either figure it out or says, who cares anyway, and go ask somebody about it. And although you can read, you can still remember the terror of being asked to read out loud in class. And in fact, you go out of your way as an adult never ever to read out loud to another adult for fear that you'll make a mistake that you don't notice, but they will. But you can read. What you'll really know about yourself is that your spelling is totally untrustworthy. You don't write anything if you can't put it through the spell check first. Thank goodness for spell check. But you know what? Spell check doesn't work for a lot of my guys. Because for spell check to work, you got to type it in close enough that the computer had some idea what word you were after. And then it doesn't just tell you the answer. Oh no, that would be way too easy. It presents a list of 10 to 15 very similar looking words. And you've got to be able to read accurately enough to figure out which word on that list really is the one I wanted anyway. But what you really dread is having to write something by hand where you can't put it through the spell checker. And so you avoid that whenever possible. Like you hate to write notes to your child's teacher. Because parents assume, wrongly, that all teachers are really good spellers. <laughs> you will also know that you can't prove your intelligence on paper still. Oh, please don't make me write a paper about it. Let me just tell you. If you talk to somebody with dyslexia, they obviously know everything about their subject. They can tell you everything about it in words this long. Their intelligence is so obvious when they talk to you. You ask them to write a report about it, you'll get three or four or five sentences, words this long, because they only dare write down words they think they know how to spell. There is such a huge difference between their obvious intelligence when you talk to them and what they can put on paper, that they're very ashamed of it, and they put, avoid putting anything on paper. And in fact, I've had adults share with me that they quit jobs over this issue. They got a job in a company. They were a superstar. So they got promoted into management. And the day they discovered that one of my responsibilities as a manager is to write a weekly report that goes either to my boss or worse yet, to the president of the company, they instantly quit. Gave up the salary, gave up the benefits, put their family at financial risk, rather than to have to show someone what they can actually put on paper. Because they're so ashamed of it. It is so far below their intelligence. It literally hurts. They will also know if they ever tried learning a foreign language, they probably couldn't do it. Now, if you're mild, 
He might have been able to learn how to speak a foreign language, but to master in print, reading, writing, spelling a foreign language? Uh-uh. In fact, there's research to prove that if you have dyslexia, it is almost impossible to master reading, writing, spelling of a foreign language. Because frankly, you haven't mastered reading, writing, spelling of your own language yet. Which is why if you can prove you have dyslexia, most colleges will waive the foreign language requirement. Now waive doesn't mean they'll forgive it. It means they'll accept a substitution. Do you know what they'll accept instead of foreign language if you have dyslexia? Anybody? Exactly right, American Sign Language. And that is truly counts as a foreign language if you have dyslexia, but it's a foreign language you can master. Because it is true multi-sensory. And fortunately, most words are just a gesture. You don't have to know how to spell them. And the few words that you do have to spell, at least it's your own spelling, not somebody else's. That they can do very, very well. But mastering a foreign language in print is almost impossible. My adults will also know that even when they're 50 years old, they do not automatically know they're left from their right. They can figure it out, but they still have to use whatever tricks mom and dad taught them as a kid to figure it out. So if I said to one of my adults, quick, touch your left knee, you probably think, go left, left, let's see. I can only make an L with my left hand. Okay. I mean, they can do it, but they still have to use whatever tricks mom and dad taught them as a kid. It's never automatic. And it's not just the words left, right. They are truly directionality confused, which means concepts like north, south, east, west are kind of fuzzy. Reading maps is a disaster. In fact, that's part of the reason why they tend to get lost a lot when they drive around. Even cities where they've lived for 10 or 15 years, that sense of directionality still haunts them. Or they finally learn one way to get somewhere but they only know one way to get there. And if they ever have to get there from somewhere else, they know the odds are pretty good. They're not going to be able to find it the first time. But it's this last point that I'm about to show you that gets my adults in the audience saying, I think it's me, I think it's me, OK, right, it's me. Still, every once in a while, they confuse their Bs and Ds. Not all the time, not if you're mild. But usually when you're under one of four conditions, when you're extremely hot, tired, sick, or under a lot of stress. If you're an adult with mild dyslexia and you're extremely tired, hot, sick, or under a lot of stress, and you jot yourself a note, it'll look fine. But then you either get a good night's sleep, or the stress goes away, or your health comes back, and you look at it later, they'll say, look at that. I messed up my B's and D's. Huh, I haven't done that for years. Why does it happen only then? When you're hot, tired, sick, or under a lot of stress? Because you don't realize how much energy you're putting into double checking until that energy isn't there anymore. When you're hot, tired, sick, or under a lot of stress. The good news is, when you get your energy back, that'll go away again for a while. But this is what dyslexia looks like in an adult who has it only mildly. And why do I bring this up? Because most people who have it mildly don't know they have it until they see what the symptoms are. And then inevitably, every time I give this presentation, when I stay afterwards and I answer questions, I'll notice there's one adult hanging around the back, just listening. And that adult waits till everybody else leaves and then comes up to me and says, you know what, that's me. I didn't know I had dyslexia before, but I matched that. That's me. And I said, well, great. Welcome to the club. And I said, well, do I really have to do something about it now? Do I really have to go for tutoring now? And I said, well, not necessarily. Is your dyslexia getting in your way right now? Is it stopping you from achieving what you want to achieve? And I'll usually think about it. I said, well, actually, no. I said, great. Then you don't have to do anything about it. Except know that this is why school was so hard for you. But please, what you do have to do is watch for it in your children and your grandchildren. About half of them will have it as well. 
and they might not have it as mildly as you. And you're going to have to relive your childhood through your children and your grandchildren. So the most important thing for you to know is that dyslexia is inherited. It is the biggest risk factor if you know there's dyslexia in your family tree. The second most important thing for you to know is that it is due to a brain difference, a physical structural difference. And please notice I said difference. I did not say damaged. I did not say defective. The brain is not damaged. It is not defective. But the structure of it is different. Their left hemisphere is the same size as everyone else's. But their right hemisphere is about 10% bigger. So if you have dyslexia, you've actually got more brain than everyone else, about 10% more on the right. That we know is a fact. We think it accounts for their very odd combination of gifts and talents in some areas and incredible weaknesses in other areas. If you've ever had the honor of working with children or teenagers or adults with dyslexia, you know they're not bad at everything. In fact, that's why they puzzle you so much. If all of this stuff is so easy for you, how come you can't spell? It doesn't make any sense. And that's why we lose sleep over these guys. If they were truly bad at everything, we'd just call them stupid and we wouldn't worry about them so much. The reason we worry about these kids and lose sleep over these kids is they're obviously bright. They're trying as hard as they know how and there's so much they can do so well that the weaknesses puzzle you. But they won't puzzle you after today. And the reason we think they have such an odd combination of strengths and weaknesses is their brain structure is different. Their right hemisphere is larger. And I'm going to go into their gifted areas towards the end of this presentation. Because yes, you can pick my kids out easily in a crowd by looking at their weak areas, but you can also pick them out easily by looking for kids who are gifted where a child with dyslexia would be gifted. So I'll share those with you towards the end. And another thing we know about the brains of people with dyslexia is the wiring is a little bit different in one part of the brain. The wiring, the nerve pathways in one part of the brain is different. The nerve pathways that connect to Brokaw's area and Warnicke's area are different. And those two parts of your brain are where you process language. So today, dyslexia is not classified as a reading problem. It is classified as a language processing problem because it will impact all four ways you process language, some a little more subtly than others. And I'll go into those as we go through this presentation. So it definitely impacts how you process language, but it also impacts two more areas big time. Directionality, lifelong confusion of left and right. But teachers, parents, you need to know it's more than just left and right. It's a lot more than left and right. Anytime you teach and you use a word that implies a direction, they're likely to be confused about it. Words like before, after, next, previous, first, last. Even words like over, under can be confusing, which is why they confuse their B's and their P's just as often as they confuse their B's and their D's. One's a left-right confusion, one's an up-down confusion, and they're confused in all directions. In fact, they're even confused in directionality as it applies to time. So concepts like yesterday, tomorrow can be very confusing. That's directionality in time. Very confused with directionality. But it also impacts one more area. And this is the area I wish more people understood was part of dyslexia. The impact that it has on your ability to memorize. Now again, it's a double-edged sword. Some things they can memorize very easily. Things they can touch, things they can see, things that are three-dimensional, no problem. Things that have logic, things that have meaning, no problem. 
storyline, song lyrics, no problem. But they have extreme difficulty memorizing two types of information. Memorizing sequences, like the alphabet, like the days of the week in order, and so on. And what we call rote random facts. Put it in, pull it out. Put it in, pull it out. Like your multiplication tables. This is the big picture of dyslexia. And it is not rare. According to the latest research from the National Institutes of Health, dyslexia impacts 20% of people in this country. That's huge. That's one out of five. It is the most common reason a child will struggle first with spelling and then with written expression. These are the kids that just can't seem to remember that a sentence has to start with a capital letter. And it has to end with punctuation. And eventually they'll struggle in reading, but not necessarily right away. Teachers, 20% of your classes have this. 20% of the kids in your class have this. Which means if you have a class of 30 random kids, 20% of 30 means five or six kids in your classroom have this. Most kids with dyslexia are not in special ed. Studies have shown only one in 10 is severe enough at the time they were tested to qualify for special ed. 90% aren't in there. You're in your classrooms where they were either never sent for testing in the first place or when they were sent for testing, they didn't have a large enough discrepancy to qualify. And these are the kids I really worry about. I call them the fall through the crack kids. You as a parent know there's something different about these kids. You as a teacher know there's something different, and yet nobody seems to do anything because they don't qualify. The other thing I want you to know is everything I'm sharing with you today is research-based information. This is not my opinion. The last thing in the world you need is yet one more person's opinion. Everybody's got them, and they're usually wrong. I mean, when I travel the country and I climb into a cab at the airport to go to a conference center and the taxi driver says, so what are you going to be speaking on? And I say, dyslexia. The taxi driver usually proceeds to tell me all the things they think about dyslexia for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> Give me their opinion. Everybody's got an opinion, and it's usually wrong. Okay? I'm not sharing with you my opinion. I'm sharing with you research-based facts. And many, many people are still unaware how much research we now have on dyslexia. They are unaware that Congress hired the National Institutes of Health back in 1978 to start scientific studies on this condition. Now, when NIH first got that contract, they went to their headquarters and thought they could do it all from headquarters. But after looking at dyslexia for six months, they went back to Congress and said, this condition is highly complex, more complex than we can possibly handle right at headquarters. So they got funding to set up dyslexia research centers at 18 leading universities across our nation. This is the first group of 18. Over the years, they've expanded this research network. And we now have dyslexia research centers at 34 leading universities in our country. All the research is coordinated at NIH headquarters but it actually takes place out here at the research centers. And an NIH will not release one single solitary fact about dyslexia that's discovered at one research center until it has been replicated at at least four other research sites. And NIH is coordinating our research with six other countries around the world. We now have over 28 years of independent, scientific, replicated research on dyslexia. We know more about dyslexia than almost any other medical or educational issue that will impact children. And yet, I bet a lot of you have never heard of this research before, because if you're like me, frankly, I think the researchers have done a lousy job getting that information down into the hands of the people who need it the most, you guys. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I am not a researcher myself. I'm trying to close the gap between what we now know based on research and what we're actually doing in the field in everyday life. 
because we know enough to make a huge difference in the lives of these kids. But in this presentation, I will only be able to share with you the most important tip of the iceberg of a huge problem called dyslexia. If you'd like to learn more after I'm done and you want to read one book about dyslexia, this is the one I'd like you to read. It's called Overcoming Dyslexia by Dr. Sally Shaywitz. Dr. Shaywitz is one of the very few researchers, she's the leading researcher at NIH, one of them, on the brain studies. And I've heard all the researchers present many, many, many times. She's one of the very few who talks like an everyday person. I mean, she talks like a grandmother. She's wonderful. You can actually understand what she's saying without being a researcher yourself. And in the first 100 pages, she summarizes what we now know based on research. In the second 100 pages, how to test for it accurately, because schools still don't do that. And the last 100 pages are what do we do about it once we find it. And although it's a very readable book, a lot of you don't have time to read a 300-page book. So no, you can also get it on audio tape. You can download it on M as MP3 files. You can listen to it on your iPod when you're at the gym. Please, if you want to read one book, this is a book to read. And if you happen to go to a school where your principal still says, I don't believe in dyslexia, give him this book. Another place you can learn about dyslexia is on our website. I created our website, which is at www.brightsolutions.us. And when I created that website, I created it for parents. I put everything on that website that I think a parent really needs to know, not only to understand dyslexia, but to make good decisions. So there are articles on there about why to say no to retention. There are articles on there about how to opt out of state standardized testing. And there are articles on there about how to deal with the self-esteem issues that so often come along with dyslexia. So please do visit our website at some point. Even if you're not a parent, you're just a teacher, it's OK. You can visit it, too. And you're welcome to copy, share, print out, Xerox, give away all the information that's on there. That's why I put it there. I want it to be shared. But I'll warn you, if you print it out, you'll probably end up with about 70 pages. But it'll be very, very good information, parent-friendly information. Now, another way you can learn more is to hire me to do all-day in-service training. And I do that across the country frequently. But you know what? There's only one of me. And I do charge a fee for that. And my schedule fills up real far in advance. So I'm trying to put everything I can on videotape so more people can learn from me. So in addition to this presentation being on video, I have three other in-depth one-hour presentations on different topics. I have one in-depth on testing who should test, what should be tested, and so on, and who should not. I have an in-depth one-hour video on classroom accommodations. And I mention this not to sell it to you. You can actually watch these videos for free on our website. So you're welcome to go to our website and watch every video I've ever made there and ever will make for free. You can actually purchase those also on video or DVD so that you can show them at a staff training meeting. You can show them at an in-service. You can show them at a PTA meeting or at a church meeting without having to hire me to come in. But the real reason I travel the country trying to educate people is I'm hoping in every audience I address, I'll find one or two people who, by the end of my presentation, become so impassioned about this situation, about this condition, about these wonderful kids that you might consider becoming a professional in this field. Because this is an emerging field. At this point, there are not enough professional tutors. There are not enough professional testers. Which is why, during the summer, I offer graduate level courses in a variety of topics. The most popular is the one called Diagnosing Dyslexia, where I teach people how to accurately diagnose dyslexia and how to write diagnostic reports that not only would hold up in a court of law, which you'll probably never have to go there with a good diagnostic report, but will force schools to do the right thing. So if you'd like to learn more about those summer seminars, please visit our website or call our office and we'll mail you a brochure.
But you might be wondering, who is Susan Barton anyway? Is she just some crazy lady from San Jose? I mean, why should we listen to her? She's not even dyslexic herself. And I'm not. I'm one of the very few professionals in this field who's not dyslexic. And so school was really easy for me. I'm not here to knock the public school system. I'm a product of the public school system. And the public school system works really, really well if you're lucky enough, like I was, to be a plain vanilla kid. I had no issues. If you have no issues, public school is a great place to be. I did really well there. I went to a public university and then went on to a career. I'm not a certified teacher. I've never taught in a public school, never wanted to become a teacher. I actually spent a lot of my initial career, 15 years worth, in the computer field in Silicon Valley, having nothing to do with reading, writing, spelling, nothing to do with kids. Didn't know what the word dyslexia meant. Didn't think I'd ever have to know what the word dyslexia meant. It was actually these two people who got me into this field. The big guy is my older brother, Tim. The little guy is his firstborn, Ben. First grandchild, first nephew, pride and joy of the family, and as it turns out, profoundly dyslexic. But it took us until he was 16 for somebody to suggest that he might have dyslexia. Now, he was struggling way before then, but we didn't know why. And when you don't know why, you're powerless. If we had known when Ben was five, what I'm gonna share with you tonight, his life today would be a whole lot different. And that's why I care. Now I'm gonna share with you a little bit about his story because it's a very typical story in a child with dyslexia. We didn't know he had dyslexia. We thought he was wonderful and terrific and bright, and he was. He loved being read to, read to every night of his life. Had great vocabulary. Made friends easily with all the kids in the neighborhood and the adults. Everybody loved Ben. Very athletic. Very, very good athletically. He was the first one to get training wheels off his bicycle. First one to learn roller skating. <coughs> you should have seen what he could build out of Legos. The most amazing three-dimensional stuff you ever saw. He could put together puzzles faster than the adults. So he was obviously bright. We thought he was going to be a superstar when he started school. But to our surprise, he flunked kindergarten. I know you guys don't call it flunked. You guys call it retained. But frankly, it's flunked. <laughs> Shocked the family. I mean, we didn't even know you could flunk kindergarten. <laughs> But things have changed so much since when I went. I mean, when I went, it was half-day milk and cookies, you know, and socializing. These days, you guys start the hard stuff right in kindergarten. And he couldn't do it. And we admitted by the end of kindergarten he really couldn't do it, so we retained him, and he went through a second time. But you know what? He didn't do that much better the second time through either. But you don't go through three times, so they passed him on to first grade. And during that summer, we tried what every parent I've ever talked to tried. Hooked on phonics. We tried all summer long, and it just didn't make sense to Ben. So we started first grade. And he had a wonderful first grade teacher, such a caring lady. Within the first week, she could see how much he was struggling. So she gave him time with a reading specialist who used a wonderful program called Reading Recovery. Wonderful if you don't have dyslexia but he flunked out of reading recovery. After 20 weeks, he was making virtually no progress. Now, some of my guys who aren't so profound make some progress, but I've discovered many parents aren't aware that reading recovery is meant to be a 20-week intervention program. And they've had their kids in reading recovery year after year after year. Guys, if it's not working after 20 weeks, it's not gonna work. And it obviously wasn't working, so this caring teacher and the reading specialist asked my brother and his wife to come in for a meeting, which they did. And they said, we are really worried about Ben. He's a bright kid. He's trying as hard as he knows how. But he's just not getting it like the other kids. And he needs more help than we can provide in the classroom. So we'd like your permission to have him tested to see whether he might qualify for even more help 
through this thing called special education, which is really mysterious when you're on the outside. But you know what? I've had some teachers say, you know, it's kind of mysterious on the inside, too. <laughs> but we could see he needed more help, so of course we signed off, and they tested him, and he qualified in mid-first grade. Oh, my goodness. If we had any idea what that meant about how profound your issues have to be to qualify that young, we would have panicked a whole lot sooner. I mean, most of my guys won't even qualify when they're in third grade. He easily qualified in mid-first. The younger a child qualifies, the more severe their issues are. But we didn't know that. All we knew is they were going to help him in the four areas where he was really struggling. They were, of course, going to provide some extra help in reading. He needed that. They were going to try to teach him some spelling tricks because his spelling was lousy. They were going to give him time with an occupational therapist because of his handwriting issues. And they were going to try to help him learn his math facts. Because he understood math, he liked math, but he always had to count on his fingers or his toes to figure out the answer. And they kept their promises. They worked with him every single day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year after year. But none of those areas got much better. Other things started to develop. By fourth and fifth grade, we started getting notes home from his teachers about his bad behavior in class, his frustrated acting out behavior, which kind of surprised us because we didn't see that type of behavior at home yet. We did see it eventually, but not then. But everything changed for Ben in sixth grade. Because at the beginning of sixth grade, they had what they call a triennial. Every three years, they have to test the kids in special ed all over again to see, is the gap closing? Can we exit him now? And the big, dark, dirty secret of special ed is very few kids exit. It's usually a one-way street. And that's what they told us at that sixth grade meeting. They said, we really hate to tell you this, but after five years, years of special ed help, Ben is now reading at beginning second grade level. He still can't spell. He still doesn't know his math facts, and he still can't read his handwriting. But we would like your permission to completely revamp his IEP to focus solely on reading. Because frankly, who cares if you can't spell or can't memorize your math facts if you can't read? Reading is a gateway to success in school, success in life, and we knew that, and we said, yes, please. So we signed off on it. And for the next four years, the school tried everything they knew how to teach him to read. And they did to Ben then what they're still doing to kids in special ed today. They searched through the district and found somebody who knew a reading program that had not yet been tried. They brought that person in, and that person worked one-on-one -on -one or very small group every single day with Ben, five days a week, week after week after week after month after month, for anywhere from four to six months, until it was obvious to everyone he wasn't getting it. Then they'd yank that person out, find somebody else in the district who knew a different reading program that hadn't been tried, and that person would come in and work their heart out with Ben, until once again it was obvious it wasn't working. And this went on for four solid years. And in retrospect, I now realize all they were doing was taking a kid who was already confused and adding another layer of confusion and another layer of confusion and another layer of confusion. But poor Ben, because that's not all that was happening to Ben. Because how my brother and his wife interpreted that meeting is maybe we were wrong to give blind trust to the school and assume they could fix this. Maybe this is bigger than the school knows how to handle. Maybe it's time to panic. And every parent reaches that point at some point or another. And we weren't panicking over his grades. We had given up on grades by then. We had told Ben, Ben, just do your best. As long as we know you're trying hard, I don't care what your grades are. What we were panicking over 
was watching the emotional damage that years and years of struggling and failing in public do to a kid. We were losing him, and we knew that. And so they did what so many parents today still do. And I'm sharing this with you because it's not unique to Ben. If you talk to parents of kids like this, they've done the very same thing. We decided maybe it's not an educational issue. So in seventh grade, we took him to a developmental pediatrician and said, can you figure out, did Ben miss some stage of development? Because this doesn't seem to be fixed educationally. Maybe there's something in his development that would explain this. And so they did a complete developmental inventory and said, you know what? You're right. He did miss a stage of development. He never crawled. Now, most kids with dyslexia do crawl. But Jen was, Ben was just one of those odd kids who went straight to walking. He never crawled. They said, that's why he can't read, write, and spell. <laughs> and if we teach him how to crawl now, <laughs> everything will get better. And so we did. This poor kid, for half an hour every day after seventh grade, crawled around the floor. Now, it wasn't ordinary crawling. It's what they call developmental crawling. First with one elbow dragging his stomach, then the other elbow dragging his stomach, then both elbows dragging his stomach, then not dragging his stomach, and so on. And you know, the saddest thing is, Ben was willing to do it. Ben was willing to do it. He said, if this is what it takes to read, write, and spell, I'll do it. I'll do whatever it takes. Unfortunately, at the end of seventh grade, he was an expert crawler. <laughs> Still couldn't read, write, and spell very well. So the next year we said, well, you know, there must be something wrong with his eyes. Now, we'd had his eyes checked many, many times. He had 20-20 vision, but he said, maybe there's something more subtle than that. So we took him to an optometrist who did all kinds of testing. He said, you know what? You're right. His convergence isn't perfect. His binocular vision isn't perfect. His tracking isn't perfect. That's why he can't read, write, and spell. And we can fix that with vision therapy. So we spent a year and over $10,000 in vision therapy. And at the end of the year, his tracking was perfect. His binocular vision was perfect. His convergence was perfect. And he still couldn't read, write, and spell very well. So the next year we said, well, maybe he just needs more intense work with phonics and instruction than the school can provide. So we enrolled him in one of those commercial learning centers. I'm sure you've got them in your community, too. The Sylvan Score Kuhlman Centers. They might help some kids, but they've got one size fits all. If it fits, great. If it doesn't fit, sorry. And we spent a year discovering it didn't fit very well for Ben. So the final year before I became involved, because I didn't become involved until Ben was in 10th grade. Prior to that, I was just an aunt on the outside looking in and wondering, why is this bright child struggling and failing? In the final year before I became involved, Ben's parents scoured the neighborhood looking for retired teachers, retired reading specialists, the kind who said, I can teach any kid to read. And we said, great, please, can we hire you to teach this kid? But all that changed in 10th grade. Because at the beginning of 10th grade, Ben had his final triennial he would have of his school career. They brought my brother and his wife in and said, well, we hate to tell you this, but after 10 years of special ed help, and after you spending the last four years and over $20,000 of your own money taking them to all the specialists in the community who claimed they could help, according to our testing, Ben is now reading at mid-second grade level. He's flunking every course he's in. And his self-esteem is about this big. We're so afraid if he tries one more thing and he fails one more time, he will never be able to get up again. So our professional recommendation as a school is maybe it's time to face facts. And the fact is, not all kids are meant to read. And Ben seems to be one of those treatment-resistant kids who's never going to get any better. So our recommendation is that we face those facts and learn to accept him for who he is, love him for who he is, and spend the remaining three years of high school trying to find something he would be happy doing the rest of his life that requires no reading, writing, spelling, or math. Despite having an IQ 
that tested above 130. That's in the gifted range. And that is not an odd combination. That's pretty common among kids with dyslexia. Plenty bright. Why is this so hard? Now, my brother and his wife did not like that advice, and they didn't accept it right away. They refused to sign anything. They went home. They cried a lot, prayed a lot, talked to some professionals, and then decided they had to accept it. So my brother sent an email to the rest of the family, and that email changed my life right away. And later on, indirectly, I was able to go help Ben, but not for a while. My brother shared what the school had recommended and said, with great reluctance, we've decided to accept their recommendation. Because frankly, we don't have anything left to try anyway. Our only goal now is to do everything in our power to keep Ben from dropping out. School is a miserable place to be when you cannot possibly succeed. Because you don't get to fail in private. Oh, no. You've got to fail in public in front of your friends every single solitary day. No wonder over half the kids in special ed never make it out of school with a diploma. But he said, by the way, we've got a new school psychologist this year. And she came from California, Ben's in Arizona, and she put something on the IEP report that nobody has ever said before. Her very last line said, I think it might be dyslexia. Just might. Not that we had any idea what that meant, even if he had it, but it gave us something to go learn more about. And that's what I decided to do. I mean, I wasn't close enough to Ben to do anything directly with him, but I said, you know what? Maybe this is how I can help. I just can't give up on such a bright kid. I don't know what dyslexia is. I don't know whether he has it or not, but surely I can try to find out. I can spend my evenings researching this. And if it is dyslexia, somebody out there has to know something. There has to be something we can do. And so I started my journey about 17 years ago way before the internet. Yes, there was email before the internet. Having no idea how hard it would be to find the answers. So what I did is what many parents today do. I went down to the library to check out every book I could on dyslexia. And there were only two. <laughs> and I read them both. I was amazed by what I learned. I called my brother and I said, you know what? We can cure this thing. I've got two books. They, they say we can cure it. We can cure it differently. One book says, all you have to do is walk a balance beam and hit volleyballs with your left and right hand, and we'll cure it. He goes, Susan, we tried that years ago. It doesn't work. And I said, well, this other book says there's only 400 words that might trigger somebody's dyslexia. And if we can figure out which words are this kid's trigger words, we can teach them to visualize those words, and they won't be dyslexic anymore. And they only charge $3,000, and it only takes a week to figure this out. And he said, that wouldn't be Ron Davis by any chance, would it? And I said, actually, it is. He goes, we tried that too. It doesn't work. And so I thought, wow, I guess this condition is rare. I guess nobody knows anything. And I guess I better go back to ground zero and start from scratch. So I decided to enroll in San Jose State University to get a master's as a reading specialist because, frankly, I'm a good reader, but I don't remember how I was taught. It just kind of worked. So I thought, I better go back and learn how to teach reading, and then I'll go work with Ben and figure out what he doesn't understand. Talk about naive as if everybody who'd worked with him in the last 10 years hadn't been trying to figure it out. And I probably would have gone down that path, except this was February, and that program didn't start till September. And while I was waiting for it to start, I saw an ad in our local paper looking for volunteers to teach reading. Now, I called the number, and I said, I really don't know if I can volunteer because I've got a full-time job. Can I really volunteer if I can only do it in the evenings? They said, well, yeah, if you don't mind working with adults. I said, adults, adults don't scare me. I'm mean, Ben's 16. Adults don't scare me. Sure, adults are OK. But I've got to tell you, I don't have a clue how to teach reading. Can I really volunteer? And they said, sure, of course. We assume that volunteers would not already know how to teach reading. So we'll train you. And I said, well, that's great. How much does your training cost? Because I knew how much college cost. They said, our training is free. I said, free? They said, well, it comes with a catch. You've got to sign an agreement before we train you that once the training is done, you will work with an adult twice a week down at the main library 
for about an hour each time for a year. And that's how you pay it back. Now, I really wasn't sure I wanted to commit for a whole year. But they cinched the deal when they said, we have training classes starting in three weeks. I didn't have to wait till September. And I will let you know that impatience is my middle name. <laughs> so I say, fine, sign me up. And talk about somebody looking over your shoulder and putting you exactly where you need to be. I ended up volunteering at an adult literacy program in California that was one of only six in our state at that time devoted solely to adults with dyslexia. Because when I shared why I was there, what I wanted to learn, they said, if you really want to learn how to teach reading to this population, you might as well cancel your master's as a reading specialist program. I was shocked. I said, why? I really do want to get really good at this. I want to teach reading. And they said, I know. But what you learn there will not help this population. I said, how do you know that? They said, because two people on our staff have masters as reading specialists. And if you have a master's as a reading specialist, you will know you haven't had one single solitary semester-long class on dyslexia and Orton-Gillingham-based methods. And I said, well, how do you know that what they teach you won't work? They said, because we tried it. When I showed up there, they'd been an organization for about 12 years. And they said, for the first 10 years, we tried to teach reading to these adults the very same way that people with masters as reading specialists teach it to the kids in school. Technically, it is called slower and louder. We teach it the same way they teach it in the classroom, just a little slower, a little louder. And after 10 years, they were about to lose their funding because they couldn't prove any progress. They finally brought consultants in and said, what are we doing wrong? And the consultants looked at the intake testing they did on these adults and said, oh my goodness, don't you realize that almost every adult here shows some pretty obvious signs of dyslexia? If that's who you're trying to teach, no wonder it's not working. More of the same is just going to get you more of the same. If you want to teach this population, we know how, but it's going to be very, very different. So two years before I showed up, they had adopted their first Orton-Gillingham program and were finally having success. So I learned that one, started tutoring adults one-on-one, -on -one, and lo and behold, it worked. Now, it's not instant overnight, but within about three months of just twice a week for an hour each time, these guys were finally reading by sounding out, spelling by sounding out. And every single one of them asked me the same haunting question that I could not answer at that time. They all said, Susan, this is so straightforward and logical. Why didn't they teach me this way in school? If they had, I would not have failed. And that would have changed my entire life. I had no idea, because I'm the outsider. I'm not in the school system. I now know, because I now work with schools every day of my life. No teacher wants to fail a child. It's just that they don't get this type of training yet in their teacher preparation courses. And that's what we've got to change. Teachers need more tools in their tool bag so they can help more kids and not fail as many. And the adult literacy program said, if you really want to learn more about dyslexia, come up to our adult literacy office. We've got all the research there. And they did. I was amazed when I went up there that they had research journals. They had videos and audios from conferences on this. I didn't even know there were conferences on this. So I started checking them out, reading them, going to the regional conferences, the statewide, the national, the international conferences, and was shocked to realize how complex dyslexia is. It is not simple. And it impacts so many areas of their life. And I stayed in the adult literacy world for quite a few years until I finally got my arms around dyslexia. I said, I think I really get dyslexia in adults now. Now I want to see it in children. What would be different if we caught it at 6 and not at 46? And taught them the right way of reading, writing, spelling from day one. What would be different? So I applied for it and got a job at a professional after-school clinic, a very expensive clinic, solely for kids with dyslexia. And I worked there for several years with a very, very small salary, with a promise that over the years I could work in each department. And we had everything there. We had advocates who went out to the schools. We had uh, 
accurate diagnostic teams. We had a psychologist on staff to deal with the emotional issues. Of course we had tutors. We had parent support groups, and it was a fabulous place to work. And I discovered to my surprise that dyslexia in the little guys looks exactly the same as dyslexia in the big ones. Same strengths, same weaknesses, same confusions. To my surprise, they teach them to read, write, and spell in pretty much the same order. They just use lower level vocabulary words and more concrete stories. They make progress at about the same rate. But there were a couple things that I was not prepared for that were very, very different. One of them was motivation. I mean, my adults were there because they still wanted to read so badly they could taste it. My little guys weren't so wild about getting tutoring. They weren't there because they wanted to be there. They were there because their mom wanted them to be there. That's a whole different story. Okay? And the other major difference was school. Because my adults were out of school. That daily pain was just a distant memory. My little guys, it wasn't so distant. It was an everyday fact. Because I got them after school, often in tears. And I would have to put my arms around them and dry off their tears and spend about 10 minutes just calming them down so that I could teach them. And they would share with me why they were crying, what had happened at school, all the teasing by the other kids, something the teacher did to humiliate them again by accident. And I would go to the head of our center, who was our advocate, and say, do you know what's going on at this kid's school? We've got to get this stopped. This shouldn't be happening. This child has an IEP, or this child has a 504 plan. How can we get this stopped? And she said, oh, Susan, you just don't understand how schools work. And I said, you're right, I need to. She goes, no, you don't want to have anything to do with schools. I said, I've got to understand what's going on at schools. We've got to, I've got to understand why this is happening. Can I come with you to those IEP or 504 meetings? She said, absolutely not. At least not until you have a lot of training in educational law. So I did spend about a year going to a lot of conferences, learning a lot about educational law, and then started attending the IEP and 504 meetings. Anybody here been to one? Whoa. Now, I've been to about 100. You couldn't pay me a million dollars to go to another one. Okay. Now, about five of them were textbook perfect. About five of them were really, really, truly were working as a team to try to brainstorm how best to support this child and give this child success. And the parent wasn't asking the school to fix the reading, writing, spelling problems. They already hired us to do that. They weren't even asking the school to pay for it. What we were asking for were free, legal, appropriate, no preparation time needed classroom accommodations. That is their legal right to have in school. And we were fought tooth and nail at most schools. Not all, but most. And I sat there in amazement, listening to the comments coming out of the mouth of the district rep or the school psychologist, or the principal, or the regular teacher, and it made me realize these guys don't have a clue what they're dealing with. They really don't understand dyslexia. They don't understand ADD. If they did, they would never say those things, and yet I could tell they believed them because they fought for hours over this. And I realized they didn't have access to the latest research. But mo to my surprise, Neither did mom or dad. I was shocked to realize that although mom and dad had paid a lot of money, knew the child had these issues because they'd gotten them professionally tested, they really didn't understand what it meant. And so they weren't doing the right things either. Because I would hear from Junior what mom and dad were doing at home to try to help. <laughs> and it was often the very wrong thing. So finally I went to the head of the center and I said, you know what, you're providing almost everything somebody needs here except you're missing one piece. Who's out there educating the adults about dyslexia and ADD? I said, until the adults get it, we're going to waste hours and hours and hours fighting each other. And I've been searching for classes I could send parents to, inside colleges, outside colleges, and I can't find any. Why don't we start offering some? And she said, great idea, needs to be done. No, we can't possibly do it. <laughs> we're up to here running a clinic. We cannot take on one more responsibility but you don't work here on Saturday mornings. You know as much about the research as we do. Why don't you start offering some classes and see whether people will come and see whether you really can explain it in a way that makes a difference. And so that's how Bright Solutions for Dyslexia started about seven years ago now. It was just part-time Saturday morning. I usually got two or three people in a class, usually parents, occasionally a teacher, and I found that I could explain it in a way that they got it. 
And when they got it, my child's life got a whole lot better. Because frankly, little kids have no power to make any change. I mean, can you imagine one of my sweet little second graders going up to their teacher and saying, you know, Mrs. Smith, the way you teach spelling, it's never going to work for me. <laughs> but I don't have to be a lousy speller. If you just teach it this way, I could become a really good speller. Would you mind, please? Little kids have no power to make change. All the power is in the hands of the adults. But first, the adults have to be educated enough to know what type of change to ask for. And then I have to make them passionate enough to give them the courage to go fight for the change. Because it usually will be a fight, but it's well worth fighting. These kids are immensely salvageable, but it's going to take us as adults to make those changes. So I stayed in that world adult literacy for about four years, the clinic for four years, and now Bright Solutions for Dyslexia. And we are not a clinic, we're not a testing center, we're not a tutoring center. Our job is to outreach and do education work across the country. You can call us and ask questions and so on. That's what we do. Oh, and by the way, what happened to Ben? I put this slide in there because I forget to tell people what happened to Ben. And they leave very upset. You never told us what happened to Ben. So this is Ben as of about two years ago. Ben is now in his mid-30s. And I did not directly help Ben, but I helped him indirectly. After about a year of working with adults and learning what dyslexia looks like, I said, you know what? I think the psychologist was right. He's got every classic warning sign there is. And therefore, the very same methods I'm using with my adults should work with him. So I got the yellow pages for Phoenix and called every single solitary tutoring organization I could find there to try to find somebody I could hire who was using an Orton-Gillingham-based system. And I'll explain what that means at the end. But you know what? Nobody knew what I was talking about. So I said, well, once again, this is going to be harder than I thought. So I decided that before I did anything, I better make sure it really worked on him. So I took three weeks off, and I flew down, and I stayed with my mother, who lives about eight miles away from Ben. And I did something to Ben that I do not recommend. Usually, we have a child two or three lessons a week. Poor Ben. <laughs> Since I only had three weeks, I gave him two lessons a day. <laughs> I had to make sure it would really work for him before I tried to make changes. So he came over at 10 o'clock. I gave him an hour-long lesson. He went swimming. He had lunch. And I gave him another one. And within three days, which was like six lessons later, my brother pulled me aside and said, Susan, I don't know what you're doing in there, but it seems to be working. I said, OK, Tim, why do you say that? What are you seeing? He says, well, as we're driving over here, he's starting to look at the words on billboards and try to sound them out. He's starting to look at the words on the sides of trucks and try to sound them out. He hasn't done that for years. Because when you can't sound out, you stop trying. And I could tell in the lessons that he was responding, just like every adult I'd worked with till that time. So I turned to my mom and I said, Mom, the good news is it's working. The bad news is, I only have two and a half weeks left. That'll be a good start, but he won't be done. And I can't find anybody down here that I can hire to keep this going. The good news is, you just retired as a nurse. <laughs> and I know you were looking for a way to spend more time with your grandchildren. <laughs> I think I found it. And she said, absolutely not. Are you kidding? I'm not a teacher. I've never taught reading. What do you think I could possibly do that all the professionals in the prior 10 years haven't done? No way I'm not going to do anything that would hurt Ben again. And I said, Mom, please don't say no yet. This isn't that hard. Please at least sit in and watch some lessons. This isn't educational therapy mumbo jumbo stuff. This is good, direct, explicit teaching that explains how spelling and reading are the same subject. And we're teaching him how to read by teaching him how to spell. She goes, I don't know what you mean by that. I said, I know. Sit in and watch some lessons. So she sat in and watched some lessons. She goes, well, you know, that doesn't look so hard. Do you really think you can teach me? And I said, yeah, Mom. I've taught a lot of people. So in the prior two, following two weeks, when I wasn't working with Ben, I was working intensely with her, teaching her how to give each part of the lesson plan, coaching her through it, creating lesson plans for her, and explaining what she'd have to do for about the next three or four months, 
and then I left. And every three or four months, I went down and taught her the next part and the next part. And bless her heart, she's the one who helped Ben. She tutored Ben three times a week for about an hour each time during his junior year, junior summer, and senior year. And Ben graduated from high school, reading, writing, spelling at the seventh grade level. This person who's not a certified teacher, who's never taught reading to anybody before, made about five solid years of progress in less than two. And that type of progress is not unusual. When in the prior 10 years, no one had made virtually any. And it's not that they didn't try, and it's not that they didn't care. They tried. They cared. Guys, trying and caring is not enough. What made the difference is she had the right training and the right tools for the right kind of kid. That's what makes the difference. And it did change Ben's life, his whole future. Now, when he got out of high school, he said, Ben, you're doing so well. You're college material. How about college? He said, are you kidding? I hate school. <laughs> I'm never going to school again in my life. You know, he had such an awful experience for those first 16 years. No wonder he hated school. But he was incredibly talented in computers. So we finally convinced him to go to a technical college that taught him how to become a certified Microsoft network administrator. That was a hot thing at that time. He's been employed in the computer field ever since, moved out on his own, got married, has started a family of his own. And that's his firstborn and so far only child, DJ, as of about two years ago. Now the saga continues. Okay. When DJ was about five and a half years old, you can accurately test for dyslexia, by the way, as early as age five. And I'm highly qualified to test for it. In fact, I train people how to test for it. When she was about five and a half and I was in Phoenix, I called Ben up on the phone. I said, Ben, could I stop by and test DJ? And he said, of course. So I did. And she does. Have some pretty severe dyslexia. And to my surprise, she also has some pretty severe ADHD. Now, Ben doesn't have ADHD. He only has dyslexia. She got the dyslexia from him. He married somebody with some ADHD, and she got that from her. So this little kid's ending up with both. But you know what? It's not that bad because we caught it early. We caught it when she was five and a half. So I went back to my mom's house. I said, Mom, pull out your books. We got another one. And she did. She's been tutoring DJ twice a week for two years. DJ's now near the end of second grade, and she's top in her class. She has never struggled. She has never failed because she was picked up early and got what she needed right away. That's what I want more people to be able to do. Pick these kids up early and get them what they need right away, and they'll never struggle. But it is also never, ever too late. My oldest student was 69 years old when I taught her how to read. It is never too late to teach them to read, write, and spell. It can, however, be too late to repair the emotional damage that comes from years and years and years of struggling. There is absolutely nothing that I can tell Ben that will ever make him believe that he's smart. And that has amazing ripples in his life, even today.